Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. We get started in our new series uh, called Stranger Things. Stranger Things. It's a series of on strange things out of the Bible because there are some stories that you look at and go, wow, that is a strange story. And we'd like to kind of address those and see what we can glean out of them, what we can learn. If you're listening by podcast, thank you for being part of our uh, church by listening to the Word of God. I want to also thank my kids that listen to my sermons. I, I count that as a badge of honor. You know, if you can keep your adult children still following your, your preaching, you, you've done something as a pastor, you know, and so uh, I feel like that's one of my greatest successes. So thanks, guys, for uh, listening. Uh, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, hopefully this one, we're trying a new pack today, so we'll see how this works. <laughs> uh, we want to minister to you our first message in this series, uh, and we're, it's just Eutychus, uh, a man who died in church. <laughs> Eutychus, he's died in church. And um, I think it's uh, pretty exciting to think about that someone died in church. Now, fortunately, good things happened to him as well. Uh, and so we're going to read the story. You want to read along with us? We're going to put it up on the screen. If you want to follow on your own device, it's the New Living Translation of the Word of God. And so the Bible says this, on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, uh, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. <laughs> Paul went down, bent over him, took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. Thank God for that. And then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. I doubt anybody fell asleep after that. I doubt. Uh, Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. He was undeterred, man. He kept on speaking, kept on preaching. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for the gift of life through Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for dying on that cross and resurrecting and giving us new life. Thank you for the blood that was shed that washes away our sins and gives us grace to live for you in this time. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here and operating in our lives and convicting us of sin and guiding us and directing us and regenerating our lives. Father, we ask tonight that you would speak to us and that we would be willing to receive for those uh, who are a bit lethargic, God. Wake them up so spiritually they can be strong in you. Give them nuggets of truth that can encourage them and challenge them. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. A young man named Eutychus is here in church and he's listening to Paul speak a message at an informal gathering of believers. He was sleepy, as we saw, most likely due to the lamps. The lamps in those ancient times were basically like candle-type things, and uh, they were lit and uh, just made the whole room comfortable. Combine that with the smoke that they were giving off, might have given it like a little bit of a sedative effect towards this young man. Plus, he was a teenager, maybe, and so... Teenagers fall asleep just about anywhere. If he was an old man, we have trouble sleeping. So uh, there you go. And so this is where he was. 
Now, what spiritual point can we make here? Well, if we're pastors, I would say falling in sleep and falling asleep in church can kill you. Now, if you're a person listening to a pastor, you might say, long sermons kill people. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, uh, that's what took place here. Who is Eutychus? We don't know much about him. There's not much written about him. Specifically, uh, like I say, not much is said. But apparently he was a believer, interested in the things of God, probably like you that are sitting here today, and no doubt like those that are watching online. He showed a willingness. He was willing to stay late and listen to Paul. I give him props for that. Sometimes people don't want to stay late. They have their agenda. They have things they want to do. And there he was, willing to stay late. He typifies many Christians uh, in our generation, and we'll dig into that in just a little bit here, but uh, first I want to say that if it wasn't for uh, 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 an extra miracle in his life, he would be dead. And the reason I say that is because that typifies many of us. Some of us, the only reason we're alive is because God gave us another gracious miracle. And, and I say that not to something to be proud of. It's not something to be proud of that Eutychus can walk around and say, hey, you know what, man? I fell three stories and God raised me from the dead. He shouldn't be proud of that. He should be known as the guy who fell asleep in church. He wasn't attentive enough. And there are many Christians, uh, the only reason they're alive today is because God raised them from the dead miraculously a second time. You got raised from the dead when you first got born again, but you just keep being lethargic and you don't put effort into your Christianity and you just care about more other things than the things of God and you can become like Eutychus very easily. Don't misunderstand. All of us are product of a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. Uh, the fact that we're alive and going to go to heaven and we're born again is miraculous. But why do we always have to have a miracle to keep us awake in the things of God? I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about awake spiritually. Why is that? Why can't we on our own say, you know what? I'm going to wake up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make myself alert. Because I guarantee you, if you spend money to go to a concert, you're going to be alert. I guarantee you, if you have a, a, a holiday coming up, boy, you're ready to go. I asked our men one time, I said, how many of you ever uh, taken holiday flights? All of them have. I said, how many have ever been late to a holiday flight? Not one of them had. But yet, how many times have we been late to a things that God had for us, whether it be church or something else that he had expectation? The point that I'm trying to make is that we do not want to be like this man, Eutychus, in the sense that we are falling asleep in the things of God. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but, and I'm not going to keep you long because I don't want you to fall three stories and die tonight. So the story also gives us this. It gives us glimmers of church, glimmers of what church is like. First of all, what we do in church is we gather. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. I want to tell you, in this generation, uh, not this generation, in this season where we have COVID restrictions and all of these regulations that we're having to deal with, uh, I'd like to say to you that we have to be very careful that we uh, begin to take meeting together uh, for granted. It is biblically important that we gather. It is biblically accurate that we gather in Los Angeles, uh, California, there is a pastor of a fairly large church, and now his church is huge large, because they had a shutdown, they shut down with everybody else, the government made them close their churches, they obeyed and did that, went online, they opened up and re had an open up, reopening and all of that, and then the government said, we're going to shut churches down again, he refused, he said, look it, we did it the first time, but this time I have to tell you, and he sent to the governor a letter of the biblical mandate of why we need to meet together. 
He takes all of the, resp- all of the precautions. He makes uh, availability for people who don't want to come. They can look online. They can stay outside and see it on a big screen. He makes all of the uh, opportunities for people to do whatever feels best for them. But he wants to be able to say, we can meet together. And look, at I'm not a, a talk, the point, this point is not to say, like, let's rebel against the government. This point is to say, as church people, as Christian people, we gather. We need each other. Whether it's a small gathering like tonight or whether it's a large gathering like on Sunday, we need gathering. We need each other. Let's never, ever forget that. Don't get so tired of your brother and sister. Well, I know them, and I know them, and oh, yeah, well, I'll catch them next time. Never, ever allow that to happen. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, we encourage each other through our gathering. We should be, and I don't want to harp on this, but we should be radical about this, aggressive about this. This should be something in our spirit because the devil's just trying to, like, fan us into sleep over this issue it's so important we should be ferocious in guarding and protecting this right that we have there's people in other countries where they cannot meet unless they are killed they would be killed if they met they look at people in countries western countries like we live in saying what's wrong with you people what's wrong with you people so we gather that's what we see they were gathered in Eutychus's time gather in our times. The other thing we do in church, and what they did is we talk and discuss things. We should talk and discuss things. Let's talk and discuss important things, not complain, argue, and bicker, but let's not debate and and, and try to argue of things. Let's try to encourage one another and, and discuss things. See, I want you to know something. People learn from people. They don't learn from a book. You give somebody Bible, put them in a room, lock the door, and open it up in a period of time, they'll be crazier than when they went in. Because that doesn't do it. The Word of God is meant to be lived out. It's meant to be something that's active, Hebrews 4.12, living, operational. It's something that's supposed to be happening between man and woman in their marital relationship. It's supposed to be operational in families. Uh, The Word of God is necessary. We need to talk and discuss these things. Uh, People learn from people. And if we gather, and here's the critical prerequisite, if we gather with right hearts towards God and towards His people, then we will learn from each other, edify each other, strengthen each other. Solutions to problems can be found sometimes in the talking and the discussing, sometimes it's through the preaching or teaching, sometimes it's through a word that someone just encourages you with, sometimes it's a question you ask and it gets answered, not always, but sometimes. The point that I'm trying to make is less of the negative and more of the positive, and our gathering experience will be a blessing. We hear and we listen when we come to church. Not just hearing, but listening. Romans ten seventeen says, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. It builds our faith. It strengthens us. But James 1, says, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. So we hear, and our faith is built up, then we go out, and we exercise it, and we live it out. We don't just listen, and then upchuck it when we leave the building. We keep it. It's it's very true sometimes. Not only do we hear and listen, I want you to know something. The dead in church can be brought back to life. The dead can be brought back to life. That's what happened here with Eutychus. Luke, the physician, wrote this passage. He wrote the book of Acts. He was a doctor. He knew he was dead. Some theologians say, well, we're not sure if he was dead. Most theologians are smarter than those two theologians and say, no, he was dead. And Paul came down and brought him back to life. And I want to tell you something. Sometimes the man of God brings things back to life. Maybe not physically, maybe not we lay out the dead, but we could. If it was God's will and it was important, sometimes it's just a person's time to die. But I want to say that in this case, it was time for him to be raised from the dead And I want you to know that sometimes you come in church with dead areas of your life, areas of your heart that need to be resurrected. 
need to be re-infused with the life of God. Not just living, not just existing, but having that abundant, super abundant life that John 10 tells us is ours as believers. The dead can be brought back to life through the word of God. How do we know that? Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and powerful. Alive and powerful. Now one thing to be watchful about, and this is our glimmer of church here, we must be careful in the attitude that we come in. Because Eutychus could have came to church. Eutychus could have, it did come to church, and we could come like Eutychus, where we don't have the right heart, the right attitude. We don't receive. We must be careful that we don't become like Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, where we have a form of godliness but we deny the power of God. We should come every day, whether it's two of us gathered in the name of Jesus, we come experiencing and expecting the power of God. Can you say amen? Ephesians tells us that we are to be people who are risen people of God. So let me ask you this question. Let me just ask you this. Are you a Eutychus in spirit? Are you a spiritual Eutychus? Is that you? Are you, are you like him spiritually? Because Ephesians tells us that we should be living Christian lives and tells us, exhorts us to love and be generous and all of these different kinds of things. And then in Ephesians 5.14, it tells us this. It says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of the sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. I thought we had these scriptures. Maybe we don't. But if we don't, I apologize. We're supposed to. 1 Thessalonians says uh, in chapter 5 and verse number 5, Ye are children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be watchful and sober. See, what are these scriptures telling us? That we should be people. We should be individuals that are awake and vibrant. And sometimes I have to say with all love and respect and desire for you that sometimes we're less than alive in the things of God. We, we're more alive in, in, in things that uh, matter not. <laughs> See, I'm here to say to you today that just because you're bored doesn't mean what's being spoken is unimportant. Eutychus was bored, but it wasn't unimportant what Paul was trying to infuse to him. See, you can know if you're spiritually drowsy if truth no longer makes a lasting impression. Truth only makes a momentary effect. It just lightly graces your your body or your person, rather. If that's all it does, then, man, something's wrong. Truth, when it's put forth with excitement and joy and firmness, I would like to tell you, man, it makes a lasting impression on our lives. Sometimes we can't even remember one nugget of truth from one moment to the next. We read something powerful at 6 a.m. in the morning, and by 6.45, we're more interested in muesli than we are the Word of God. Can you say amen? Spiritual drowsiness. If you could walk away easily from biblical principles, you've become spiritually drowsy. See, I've got to tell you, those things should be things that you, you, you have trouble walking away from them. You, have, you, you, you cannot. I have to remain firm in the Word. I have to remain firm because these are what the Bible tells us are a, 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 a reality. See, understand with me that people that are like Eutychus are not spiritually aware of what's really going on. They're more 
pulled into what's going on by the news or by the unsaved people or by the culture of the world. But Christians, uh, on fire, vibrant, spiritually alive and awake people. Now those kind of people, they're aware of what's happening. They recognize what's taking place. They're not just like lemmings going along with the crowd. No, they've made a decision that the Word of God, the Spirit of God is going to guide and direct their life. Can you say amen? See, the fact that Christians don't know what's going on is why conspiracy theories thrive in our day. I'm not going to harp on conspiracy theories, but those theorists, uh, they gain so much traction because they weave a story with a gram of truth and a kilo of fantasy. They just put a little truth in with that, and, and, and Christians bite. Christians go, yeah. Christians are looking for something that's titillating. This is how we are. So here's the question today is what do you do if you recognize that you're becoming spiritually drowsy? What do you do? What, what is it that you do? I would like to say one truth, one nugget that I want you to remember. And if you forget everything else, remember this. Get away from the lamps. Get away from the lamps. You remember back when we told, talked about the text? The lamps are what were there. Those lamps were bringing comfort to the house. It also emitted smoke. And oftentimes, our problem is we're, we're spiritually drowsy because we're just far too comfortable. And I pray, <laughs> I'm not even sure this... You know, I, I, I'm writing an article. I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day, but the pastor as a provocateur. A provocateur is an agitator, someone who causes dissension. I feel like men of God should be more like provocateurs than managers and keepers of the castle. I think men of God should be ones that can go in and start a fire and should be able to, like, cause something. And people go, whoa. Yeah, it brings a little offense sometimes, but... I, I believe that's what's missing in our generation, honestly. And I'm not just talking about pastors. I'm talking about individuals. We should all be provocateurs, you know. And sometimes we're not because we like our comfort. We like it the way we uh, bring warmth, you know. This is why some people, you see them, they got their big coats on. Even when it's not even cold, they have their coat on. It's all wrapped up around here. Why? Because it brings a sense of of comfort to them. Spiritually, some people are like that. They're just trying to make things comfortable. And sometimes you become spiritually drowsy when that happens. You've got enough money now, you know. Things are okay. It's, things are settled down. There's no problems. Sometimes we need something to stir us up. And I got to tell you, it's going to take a lot because when COVID first hit, my prayer was like, Lord, this, this is it. Is this what you want? Is this what you're doing to shake Christians? Thus far, not much. Thus far, not what the Bible demonstrates. And you can blame me, criticize me, come up with another a solution to it. But I want to tell you, what do you want to be, Paul or Eutychus? You know, that, that, that's what you, you got to decide. You know, you, you, you can criticize fanatical people like me, wild, that throw their arms around and far too animated and all those things. You can do that. Or you can say, wait a minute, I've got something. God's challenging me to be a provocateur. Get away from the lamps. They made them comfortable. The effects of their Christian witness was taken away when you're too comfortable. <laughs> you know, one thing that uh, when this church was first uh, uh, pioneered, <laughs> it wasn't always known for good things. It was just known. And sometimes that's what it is. This guy that's the pastor in L.A., he's doing the rounds on the L.A. television news programs. And, you know, he's usually a pretty mild guy. Now they're saying, hey, are you willing to go to prison over this? He looked in the camera and says, bring it on. I thought... There you go. Here's a Bible teacher going, I'll start a prison ministry. That's what he said. 
<laughs> I wonder how many of us will do it. Oh, dearie me, no. <laughs> See, the lamps also gave off smoke. They gave off smoke. And in my mind, I'm thinking of this, that smoke clouds and it masks. And I want to say to you that there may be some things in your life that are clouding your vision, clouding your progress, clouding the next step. You've allowed them in. And, and I, I'm not trying to hurt you at all. I'm trying to get you to a place so you're not Eutychus falling three stories down here. And I would like to uh, uh, remind you that the devil's strategy, we know the Bible says, is to blind. It's to blind, is to get you to stop having vision. And it, it, oftentimes he can't blind us by gouging out our eyeballs. He does it by distracting us and getting us focused on things that are not what he's doing. For some people, it's their refusal to see what's happening now. They're still stuck in days gone by. They're wanting and they're longing for this. They kind of miss the boat, you know. <laughs> I grew up uh, mostly in the 70s, but I remember in the 70s uh, when things were changing in America, and people were going from the hippie era of the 60s where the long hair, far out man, and, you know, dropping LSD. It was becoming more into a different era. But there were some people that were still wanting those 60s to be happening. They wore their John Lennon glasses, you know, even when they were far out of date, you know. They kept their hair long when people were changing their styles. And uh, the point that I'm trying to make is sometimes we cloud ourselves by wanting to uh, uh, hang on to a bygone era. Some people, they want to read stories uh, about revivals that happened a long time ago, and I get it. I, I read most of them myself, and they're inspiring, but I don't long for that. That motivates me to want to see that now. It motivates me to want to do God's will. I don't want the smoke of the past to drag me back. I don't want to be distracted or mask my vision for what God is doing now, and neither should you. If you're listening online, man, God has a plan for you. It's important for you to recognize that, and don't allow the distraction, the smoke, the comfortability, the, 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 the lamps that are keeping you in that room, and you're on the windowsill just about ready to fall over. Don't let that happen. Can you say amen? Today, Eutychus, the man who died in church. Next week, we're going to cover another Stranger Things story. A little bit more strange. I wanted to ease into this and give you one that wasn't so strange, but uh, we'll, we'll progress from here. But I hope today that you can work at not being spiritually drowsy. I hope you can understand the importance, like they did, of gathering together. They stayed all night. I'm not saying we need to stay all night. It's a different culture that we live in, but we should be wanting to meet. We should be wanting to gather. We should love one another and care for each other. Why don't we bow our heads and let's go before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, asking God that you would continue to bless and encourage, strengthen each one of us. Lord God, help us as we have heard this word that we would not fall pray to the things that cause Eutychus to fall out that window. We thank you for the miracle. We thank you for using the Apostle Paul to raise him back to life. But Lord God, we do not want to even fall asleep in the first place. Help us to rise from the dead, Ephesians 5.14. Help us to understand that the night is far spent, that it's time for us to awake and to arise, Romans 13.11. Lord, help us to be 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, and to be those people that would raise up, rise up, awaken, make a difference in our generation. Help us to get away from the lamps. Praying in Jesus' name. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. 
Maybe you're listening online. Is God speaking to you about your life? Maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ. If you do, we're going to pray a prayer right now so that you can repeat this prayer and you can accept Jesus into your heart and you can have the experience of what it means to be a believer, not just a mental thing that you sign up for, but a believer that's real and active, the Holy Spirit working in your life. And so I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And my brothers and sisters that are already saved, for the sake of those who might need to repeat the prayer, you repeat it with me also. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I dedicate my life to you and ask that you would teach me and help me. I believe in Jesus. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, praise God for that. Praise God. You might feel something, you might not. That's not important. What is important is that Jesus is real in your life, and by faith you accepted that. Brothers and sisters, why don't we all stand to our feet? Because I want to just pray over you tonight concerning this spiritual drowsiness. You know, sometimes on a Wednesday night, because of our uh, attendance levels, you know, you can feel like, ah, not much is happening. I want to tell you, man, God is moving dynamically, whether we feel the vibe or not. He's a dynamic God. He's always moving. The question is, am I awake or alert to hear that? See, because when you're in a place where there's a vibe going on, you don't even have to do anything and the vibe's on you. But I'm talking about here where you're not waiting for a vibe. (laughs) You're the person that can dance without music. You're the person that can trust and believe and be excited because you're alive. And because you're alive, you're resonating with the living God. And I want to pray over you that you would capture this and you would gather this and you would desire this and it would put some fervency in your heart and it would cause you to say yes I want to be passionate about my Jesus I want to be passionate about the things of God the word of God like the people in the Bible I want to be like them that's a good thing so lift your hands would you all just lift your hands let me pray with you today father I just pray your power over your people I pray that they would receive God this desire to rise up and awake. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them and help them. Bless them, Father God. Provide for them, Lord, as only you can. I bind the strategy of the devil against their life. Lord, even that thing that's within them that is sedate, even that thing that is within them that causes them to lack the fervency of the moment and the desire of the Holy Spirit, God, Release something new in them. Release something exciting in them. They desire to be that way. Pray this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Receive it. Live it. Your personality, we say this every time we talk about something like this, your personalities are all different. Fair enough. But you know if you have fire. Every person knows. And if you don't have fire, you need it. You need it because we don't want to be laying dead on the pavement outside. Thanks for coming today. Turn around, greet each other. Enjoy the rest of your uh, week. We'll see you back on Friday for prayer and youth and a great day on Sunday. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305, or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36 BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.